not being able to be heard. Yeah. I don't think I'll give you that. I, don't th I didn't think so. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Steven Spatz, Assistant Outreach Librarian, and on behalf of Library Director Joe Lucia and the staff of Falvey Memorial Library, I'd like to welcome you to today's Scholarship at Villanova Lecture Series event featuring a talk by Michael Hollinger. The Scholarship at Villanova series is a library-sponsored forum for faculty authors and award recipients to showcase their latest academic research and publications. Over the years, we've had speakers from a wide variety of departments across campus, yet today's event is a first, as far as I know, our first ever lecture from a theater professor. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the Scholarship at Villanova series will continue on Wednesday, March 24th at 4.30 p.m. with history professor, professor Judith Geisberg presenting on her latest book, Army at Home, Women in the Civil War on the Northern Home Front. Information on this and all other library events is available on our website, library.villanova.edu. And this afternoon, we are pleased to have with us Michael Hollinger. Mr. Hollinger is Associate Professor of Theater at Villanova University and the Associate Artistic Director of Villanova Theater. He's an accomplished playwright with productions of many of his works, including the plays Opus, Tooth and Claw, and Red Herring, having been staged around the U.S. and across Europe. And we have selected volumes at the bookstore table in the back available for perusal and purchase. He has recently finished a new play entitled Ghost Rider, and his new musical, A Wonderful Noise, co-authored with Vance Lemko, received the Frederick Lowe Award for Musical Theater. In addition to writing and teaching, Mr. Hollinger has been active as a dramaturge, providing consulting services to prominent local theater companies such as the Arden Theater Company, 1812 Productions, and Interact Theater Company. Today, Mr. Hollinger will be sharing with us his insight into the writing process, especially with regard to the importance of revision and the interplay between discovery and design. Please welcome award-winning playwright, Michael Hollinger. We theater artists aren't accustomed to getting our applause before we do anything. We usually like, have to work for that. Um, who, other than my graduate theater students, knows what a dramaturg is? Anybody? There we go. Stephen knows in the back. Some people a little bit. Uh, the kind of dramaturgy that I do when I consult as a dramaturg is mostly consulting with playwrights and directors on how to make plays better. Um, and we have a great dramaturgy program here at Villanova where we also train students uh, to be dramaturgs and work with historical information and enrich the world of the play for the collaborators. But that's what, not what I'm here to talk about today. Um, the promotion was all about killing trees. Um, and I confess, I am a tree killer. Um, I'm not a lumberjack, <laughs> though I envy the, the being outdoors and getting a lot of fresh air. But I, I kill lots and lots of trees in my line of work. And um, I have some regrets about it, but I also understand that paper is, the is probably the most necessary tool of my trade. And if I do my job well, I spoil a lot of it. Uh, and I'll show you some of my spoiled paper along the way. And the point really here, and you'll see all throughout my talk, is that I'm looking, uh, I'm trying to find out how to winnow out something that is good by taking wrong steps, by going the wrong direction, and by turning back and, uh, and revising, which is what this stuff is all about. Um, the, all the paper that I spoil is not intended to be seen on stage. That's the kind of bizarre fact of playwriting, is that what you're creating is a blueprint that hopefully your collaborators will then take on, your directors and your actors and your designers, and make something wonderful that doesn't make the audience think about paper at all. It makes them think about lives and actions. So the paper stuff is really all the stuff underneath the iceberg. This job title, playwright, I'm very proud of. It's a very archaic word. It has the word right in it, W-R-I-G-H-T, which we have in other archaic professions like cartwright and wheelwright and shipwright. Um, and it's a, it comes from an old English origin for worker. A right was a worker in some sort. So I like the fact that it's connected to a sense of building stuff, to a sense of construction, that it's not just about artistry. We think about the theater as being, ooh, all that fun, make-believe, play stuff. Um, but that it's, you could rarely find more pragmatic people than theater people. They're always figuring out, how can we get it done? How can we get it done for 20 bucks less? Can we fit it in this space, et cetera. So playwrights are very pragmatic and need to be pragmatic. Um, the main national organization that advocates for playwrights, a membership organization, is called the Dramatists Guild. And a guild also is a very old word that's usually 
thought of in Middle Ages as holding together carpenters and bakers, some kind of organization which holds these craftspeople together. So it's a useful way of thinking about it, and I think it also unsentimentalizes the writing process. We're building stuff here. We're taking it apart, we're putting it back together. And although it's deeply personal, we hope, although, although we squirm and wince a little bit as our little piece of paper goes towards the reader, or the actors come on stage to, uh, to speak our lines, um, we have to understand that it's something that we can take away and pull a nail out and put another piece in. It can be fixed. It can be improved over and over again through a series of drafts. I've been watching the Olympics from time to time lately, and I've been watching, you know, figure skaters, paired figure skaters, and thinking like, my God, like for three minutes you have to do that thing. I don't have to do that thing in three minutes. I can do it over and over and over again until I hopefully get it right or really, really close. But I don't have to do it in three minutes in front of you know millions and millions of viewers, and that is one virtue of writing and rewriting. Um, I like to think of, of the process. You know, I'm a playwright for my whole life. I hope this is something I can do after my knees wear out, uh, that I'll still be able to do it and hopefully do it better. Um, what we usually see when we're studying literature of any kind and when we're studying plays is we usually see those works that have survived centuries or at least decades. We see works that are now part of the canon. And so we see the blossom of that writer's work. We don't see all the drafts that have been cast aside. We see Shakespeare's As You Like It. We don't see Frolic in the Woods, his first draft, where Orlando dresses as a woman to avoid having to wrestle Charles. We don't see those missteps. We do have that virtue sometimes with modern and contemporary playwrights where we get a glimpse of some of those early steps. Uh, critic John Law, writing in The New Yorker about 10 or 11 years ago, interviewed Arthur Miller uh, because it was the 50th anniversary of Death of a Salesman and discovered upon researching the play that the, that the original title of the play was The Inside of His Head. <laughs> I think Miller did better <laughs> with the new title. Um, but it's just an example of how something even as monumental as that, which we think must have been handed down by the gods, had missteps, had mistakes, had backtracks in it. Um, Miller's opening notes in his notebook, he actually built a little shed behind his house in order to write in. It was something he had to do. I think of playwright building and carpentry. Miller understood in some level that he had to build a structure to build a play. Uh, so he built this structure and he started a notebook. On the very first page, the very first thing he wrote in his notebook was the idea that Death of a Salesman would start at the top of the Empire State Building with a dialogue between two guards, security guards. So he wrote, scene one, atop Empire State, two guards, who will die today? It's that kind of day. Fog and poor visibility. They like to jump into a cloud. Who will it be today? Well, those of you who know Death of a Salesman know that nobody jumps from the top of the Empire State Building, that we're, we're located lower to the ground than that. Um, though the place pretty, pretty wonderful. He didn't need ar that kind of architecture in order to do it. Um, and all of my work has the same sort of notebooks attached to it and the same sorts of amusing missteps. Today, at the end of this talk, you're going to hear some scenes, two scenes from two different plays and two different versions of each of those scenes, which show you really how different things can be between different drafts in the search for something that's actually going to work and be theatrical. I found that this emphasis on process, this emphasis on let's get through the mess to get to something that's, that's good and worthy and interesting and theatrical, um, it's not an idea that I started out with as a teacher. When I first started teaching playwriting, I thought, well, let's see, students need to write, certainly, their own work, but they also need to study great works. And so the very first playwriting class I ever taught included a volume called Nine Plays of the Modern Theater, uh, and it included masterworks of the 20th century, uh, Beckett's Waiting for Godot, Ionesco's Rhinoceros, uh, Durand-Mott's The Visit, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead by Tom Stoppard, American Buffalo by David Mamet. And every week my playwriting students would write their own plays and they'd bring their scene work into class and they would have read one of these plays. And I saw as the weeks went by this kind of weight upon their shoulders with each passing week. And I gradually understood it's because 
these little tiny babies that were coming out of their pens and their computers were trying to stand up next to these massive giants of modern theatrical literature, and there's no way. And we don't see all the earlier drafts of that anyway. All we see is the blossom of what might have been months or years, in some case decades of thinking and working and the refinement of a play, which you know, is the cream of the crop of a century. So I decided at that point to stop teaching masterpieces in my class. I know in, at Villanova here, rightfully, a lot of attention is paid to important canonical works that have endured for decades or centuries. And the students who come to my class can study that elsewhere. And I think it's very important to study it elsewhere. But in my class, I like to teach flawed plays by flawed living playwrights, including myself. Um, we make sure always to read a play by a living writer that we'll also see in its premiere production in Philadelphia. And then bring that living writer to the classroom to prove that not all playwrights are posthumous. <laughs> and to ask that playwright questions about, like, how did you do this thing? And I noticed that the production was different from this scene that we read in class. And why did that change? And how did this compare to what you had in your mind? And what changes are you going to make after you do that? Very important. I taught as an adjunct professor at Penn for a while. Uh, a playwriting class there, and on the way up to my playwriting class, there was a, a split staircase that would go up, well, with one staircase that would go up and split, and at the top of it was a portrait of Shakespeare that's probably about eight feet tall and eight feet wide. And I kind of thought about these poor students who go up and they have to pass Shakespeare <laughs> on the way to, your, to the playwriting class, like, you know, who are you to try to write a play? Hasn't this guy already written all the plays? So it's a hard battle, especially if you're well-read to not have the editor on the shoulder and say, well, Miller might have done it better. But it's the only way we get better, is to keep working through it and working through the problems. So what is the creative process for a playwright? There are some. Um, Edward Albee and Harold Pinter, <coughs> among the last century's masters. And Edward Albee is still with us, so we won't count him out yet. But there are a few who say, well, I start on page one. I start with the first character saying the first line, and then I have the second character say the next line, and then the next character, and then the next, and the next, and then I'm done, and then I'm finished. And maybe I'll change a couple words, and that's it. And we hate them. <laughs> at least I do, because that's not how I work at all. Uh, I never have. It's always been a more of a slogging process. Neil Simon, on the other hand, also one of the most widely produced playwrights of the 20th century, um, titled his autobiography, Rewrites and noted how his first play went through 22 drafts before it was finally fully staged, mounted, and ultimately published. And that's a little bit more like, like my rhythm, that process. I often use the metaphor in my class, the, the dialectic between architecture and archaeology, and that both of them have to work together. The architecture side is, we have an idea. We plan, we think ahead, we say, you know what, what if it looked like this? What if it was shaped like this? What if it went to this place? But architecture alone can be cold. Maybe architecture doesn't actually honor human nature. Maybe when we find that, well, when I want the character of Bob to go into the kitchen and slap Darlene and Darlene kisses him, that I don't really buy it when the scene happens. And maybe that's not what should happen at all. So architecture is great. We need to plan stuff, but we need to be open to the possibility that these characters, in order to be true with them, to them, need to do something else. And the other half is archaeology. And archaeology is about digging and digging down and not knowing precisely what you're going to find down there, only knowing that unless you get a lot of dirt out of the way, you're not going to find anything of value at all. And so the archaeology part is, huh, that's interesting. Bob slaps Darlene and she kisses him. What's that about? What do I need to know about Bob and Darlene in order, in order to understand that? Um, and so the digging down is the asking questions, is actually allowing yourself to be naive about your own work and say, if I were a detective, if I were a literary critic trying to figure out who these characters were, what would I learn about them that I, as a playwright, don't know or don't know that I know? And I like the archaeology part of this metaphor particularly because oftentimes in life, we want to treat things like uh, archery, another A word. We want to think like, there's that goal over there. I want to do that thing. I want to nail that thing. I want to get, I want to get that bullseye. So if we shoot and we miss the bullseye, we feel like, oh, man. Let me tell you, like every playwriting class I teach, virtually every scene that's ever read, nobody hits a bullseye. My first drafts, never. Who hits a bullseye? 
So the archery thinking is not helpful. The idea is like, well, what do we learn? I mean, even archers, what do you learn when you take 10 shots and you see where the arrows go? How can we use that information next time to try to get closer? So I like the architecture, archaeology one better, because it says, guess what? You're going to have to remove some dirt to get to the goodies. And maybe you went down five feet and you need to go down six feet. Maybe you need to go down 10 feet and just remove more dirt until you get to it. But it's a process that, I should say, it's, it's an idea that honors process. It's just a mental shift. It says, I'm on my way to getting closer to it. This is my box. Let's see if I can get my box where you can see it. Um, well, that's my box here. I'll open it up. I have a box like this for every play I write. Should I be talking over here so I can be recorded? Um, sometimes I have two boxes if the play is, takes a long, long time or has lots and lots of research attached to it. Um, the box itself is very tidy. But what's in it is very messy. Uh, it includes all kinds of stuff. In it, I throw the research that I undertake when I'm working on a play. In it, I throw the notebooks that I scribble notes in. In it, I put in all the drafts of everything that I've done on the way to writing the play. So I'm going to uh, toss these down here. You can count them if you want. Draft? Somebody keep track of that. Mark, will you keep track of my, my drafts here? This is uh, my box for a play called Opus, which some of you have read here, uh, if you're with Gail's class, or you're with your my, my graduate playwriting class. Opus is a play about a string quartet um, in crisis that was premiered in Philadelphia about, that's a very good question, about four years ago. Uh, and, and, and happily is being done quite widely right now. Um, this is all the messy that preceded that. So, in this box includes documentary about a famous string quartet called the Guaranary String Quartet. A book about that same quartet, another book written by that quartet which tracks the playing of a string quartet note by note. Another book that's about that string quartet, all about the inner workings of this odd little profession. Um, another draft. This is on blue paper. Um, that might seem inconsequential. Very often playwrights when they're working in rehearsal or in workshops will replace pages with revision pages that are placed in color. So some of these scripts you'll see that there's white pages and there are colored pages mixed in. This is so that actors who are working on the scripts day to day will go, well, is my 17 the right 17? Is it blue 17 or canary 17? Oh, okay, blue 17. All right, we'll take that out today. So, another draft. Another draft. This was a scene, Opus involves scenes where four string quartet players are being interviewed separately by a documentary filmmaker. And one of the points I wanted to make in the play was that although these four people play in beautiful harmony with each other, that in fact their points of views, their attitude, their personalities, their temperaments are entirely at odds and utterly different. And so this was a cut and paste job where I realized that I wanted to write what each of these people thought and felt what they were going to say to the interviewer, but I wanted to cut it up so that we only got it in snippets, in a kind of jagged way. That's what that is. So I like use, to use tape and scissors, too. It's another draft. What are we up to, Mark? Five. We're up to five? OK. All right, here's another one. These are notes and scribbles. Another draft. There's blue and white pages. There's another draft. Um, Ah, uh, this is research, music, sheet music, uh, recordings. When I started working on this play, I told a friend of mine who's a cellist, I'm writing a play about a string quartet, and they, you know, they have all these problems. I think they're going to break up. Maybe they fire their, one of their violinists. And he said, oh, you know about the Audubon String Quartet, right? I said, no, what's about the Audubon String Quartet? Oh, well, there's the string quartet, and they fired their first violinist. And now there's all these legal suits and legal battles. So. I suddenly found that the universe was rewarding me by saying, you know what, this idea that you have is actually based in reality. So I have research here on the Audubon String Quartet, on auditions for uh, major orchestras, all of which attach to the play. All right, use it. More notebooks, more scribbles. It's really odd, I should pass that around. More notebooks, more scribbles. Pass that I don't want to find those on eBay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a couple more drafts here. One, 
two, three, what are we up to, Mark? Eleven. Eleven dreads. <laughs> there might be a couple that I didn't put in here. This is what the play looks like now. <laughs> <laughs> it looks so tidy. It looks so clean. It looks like the guy who wrote this really knew what he was doing. Um, and yet you can see that there was a lot of dirt that got removed on the way to getting to this play, and that's true of everything that I worked on. This is a principle that I like to refer to as messy tidy. How do you be messy enough in the process so that you can explore <coughs> terrain in a rich and comprehensive way? How can you write like a child without the editor on your shoulder uh, and find the goodies? And then later on, when you've done that, how can you set the child point of view aside and be the parent and say, you know what, that was interesting, but that tangent isn't really useful for the play. It doesn't tell the story. One of the great, great secrets of writing, and this is true of academic writing as well as creative writing, um, is that you mix the generative process and the editing process at your peril. It's one of the great hazards of working at a computer. Because a computer always looks clean. It always looks tidy. So there's an invitation for your writing to want to be tidy. At least there is for me. Uh, why I work by hand first is so that I can be as sloppy as possible. My handwriting is idiosyncratic, as everyone's handwriting is. Handwriting is closer to painting than typing is. Typing, you make essentially the same gestures no matter what words you're making. But when you're writing, you're saying, Bob slaps Darlene, your handwriting changes. And when you cross it out and say, wait, Darlene kisses him. No, Darlene slaps him. No, Darlene kisses Bob and then slaps him. Um, all of that is recorded with pressure and angle and cross out. And I happen to like that. I feel like I'm playing in the, you know, in the compost heap or something like that. And later on, when editing, when typing up, those things become tidy. It's a very good process. A, a long ago, I heard the tip that in academic writing, um, if you're on a time deadline, you've got two hours to write your paper. Divide your time in half. Only generate material for the first half. Only edit for the second half. And to not mix those points of view. It's an interesting thing if you try it. Um, in revision, one of the ways I like to talk with my students about revision is like a hand of poker. Here's what you got. You know, you finished your first draft. Here's what it is. Read it. See what's there. Just like you get your hand, right? You go, huh, I got this card, that card, that card, that card, and that card. Every poker hand tells a story. It might not tell a very good story. A good poker hand promises a good story, but Almost never is it a complete story. It's missing something, and it's got stuff that doesn't belong there. And a good poker player identifies the possible stories that this hand is trying to tell, understands which good story it might tell is most likely, removes what doesn't belong there, and takes cards in in hopes that it will tell that story. Now, the difference with playwriting is we get to keep giving cards back and taking them and giving cards back and taking them and getting as many cards as we want in order to have this story be the best story it can possibly be. You only get to do that once in playing poker. Um, so I'm going to use an example here. We're going to work with a, a fictional story. Let's imagine a 17th century storyteller has an idea for a story called Death in the Woods. It's got a great title. It seems like it's going to be very dynamic. And. Um, the basic idea is this. A man goes into a forest and fights a man-eating bear. That's all he knows at the start. It seemed like a good idea for a story. If I were the storyteller, I would start asking certain amounts of questions. This is that archaeology quality. Well, but who is this guy? Why is he going into the woods in the first place? Does he need to go in the woods? What's the deal with the bear? Is he going in order to fight the bear? What's the reason for it? I want to know about that person and what that character's objective is. What does this this character want in the world? Uh, does he have a name? Does he have a profession? I like to think about what in the telling of the story raises the stakes as high as possible? Why is it important? Why does it matter? How can the stakes be as high as possible? Maybe it's not a man. Maybe it's a boy. 
suddenly the character is smaller, younger, less experienced, not as strong. The stakes seem to be higher all of a sudden. But still, there's no reason for this boy to be in the woods. Maybe the boy is carrying medicine for a sick person and has to go through the woods, even though the woods contains a man-eating bear. The stakes are suddenly higher. The boy has a very strong and altruistic purpose for being there. Oh, bears don't usually eat people. Hmm. All right, well, maybe it's not a bear. Maybe it's a wolf. Hey, what if it's a wolf? That's great. A wolf is kind of predatory, and the boy goes to the woods trying to get medicine there, and it turns out to be oh, there's this wolf there, uh, a sick person. Who's the boy trying to take a sick per medicine to? Maybe a grandmother. Maybe there's a sick grandmother, and yeah, well, a stronger connection. That's good. Grandmother, and wolf is a predatory animal. What if it weren't a boy? What if it were a girl? And then it's got these sexual overtones. Girl goes into the woods to carry medicine to sick grandmother, meets a wolf. So I don't know that Little Red Riding Hood was written this way, <laughs> but it might have. And good fairy tales, good myths tend to have similar qualities. That is that over the centuries, the rough edges have been worn off and only the elemental parts remain. You know, people don't tell Little Red Riding Hood and tell side stories about, well, what you need to know is that Little Red's father was killed in the war, and he didn't have any money, and the grandmother lived nearby, and then 10 years ago, the mother looked to remarry, and there was this woodsman. She didn't, we don't need it. And so, so what happens over time is those things just fall away, like the good poker hand, as the cards get discarded, and just the right cards are in the story. And so what we try to do as writers is to continually see the play from a little bit of a distance to say, what is it that it really wants to be telling? What is the play telling me? And what does it feel like it wants to tell ideally? And how can I help it by removing what doesn't belong there and by putting in what does belong there? So that ultimately the shape and the experience of it is as refined feeling as Little Red Riding Hood. That's a tall order. If you think you're, you know, dominated by Shakespeare, try living up to Little Red Riding Hood. Okay. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about this play, Opus. My background is as a musician. I went to a conservatory, Oberlin Conservatory, and studied viola uh, in an effort to become a professional violist. Yeah, how about that? And um, I decided to go for a more solid profession like theater. <laughs> so I studied seriously. That was my intention. I loved playing chamber music, string quartets especially. I didn't particularly love playing in orchestras. And I graduated. I was supposed to go to grad school uh, and get an MFA in uh, viola performance. I had a full ride to do so. And I asked that this be deferred for a year because I was a little burned out. That year turned into two years, then three, then four. And three, and four. I eventually came to Villanova as a theater student, and that took me into a different path. And I left my viola behind for about 18 years. And then one day in my neighborhood, an old man was walking down my street carrying a violin, my neighbor. And I said, you're a violinist? I had no idea you were a violinist. I'm a violist. Oh, really? Well, you should play in this chamber music group that's in the next town over. The people meet every other week, and we play string quartets, and it's wonderful. Um, so I got into this group and started playing string quartets every other week, and I loved it so much. And it reminded me that about 20 years ago, yeah, that's a long time ago for some of you, um, 20 years ago, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a play about a string quartet where the dialogue of the characters was musical, where it felt like the interchange of notes in a string quartet. I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea how you would write it. I had no idea what it would be about. And so I let the idea drop. And now playing chamber music again on a daily basis, after having become a playwright and written a lot of plays, I started thinking, you know what? Maybe I could write that string quartet play. I wonder what that play would be about. Now at this point, I learned over many years of being a playwright that plays are about problems. Plays are not about people being happy and content and getting along. Plays are about forces colliding and people in conflict. So the string quartet is clearly about people who are having a problem, maybe not getting along. And I thought about rock bands you know, that have these dis very public disruptions and conflicts. I thought, well, maybe that's the world that this play is in. Maybe it's a string quartet that's in conflict. Now, you might think that string quartet players are very genteel and get along beautifully. They're, 
they're as tempestuous as rock and roll musicians. Um, and I played in some quartets that had some tempestuous things, but I also had been in the theater for years up to this point and realized that the process of making art together <laughs> with a few people in a room is very universal. Whether you're trying to do plays for children's theater, whether you're, um, whether you're a civic organization trying to come up with uh, a plan for a new city park bench. Um, Any time a few people need to get together, and those faculty members here understand what I'm talking about in terms of faculty meetings, any time a small group of people try to get together to do something that matters a lot, that's when human collisions happen. And so that was kind of my entree for this. Um, I didn't know what would happen next. I had to ask the question, who are these people? Why is it dramatic? Why is it interesting? This play, like all of my full-length plays, was written to deadline. And the deadline was utterly self-imposed. If I don't have the deadline, it probably won't get done. So I threw a dart at a map. I said, I'm about to have a little baby girl born in January, so let's have a reading in December of this play, and I'll make sure that it gets done. And it's the, basically the fear of public humiliation. I know that if 100 people are going to show up to hear the play, I'll finish it, and I'll have a draft there. And that's how it got done. Since then, it's been whatever how many drafts uh, since then, and now happily it's been getting done quite a bit. I'd like you to hear uh, one scene from this play, but in two very different drafts. And we're going to read them in reverse order. In other words, you're going to hear uh, one of the last scenes in the play, Opus, uh, in its current form. And then I'm going to have the same actors read it for you in its very first draft. Before I invite the actors up, I need to tell you some things about the world of the play. Um, Okay, uh, this string quartet is called the Lazara String Quartet. It was made up of four friends who all met when they were in music school. They become very successful. They won a Grammy Award. Uh, there is a relationship between two of the players, both men, uh, for many years, but one of the players had some emotional and mental uh, difficulties, and the other player was rather uh, A-type and anal, and this was not working very well. And so the character with some emotional problems was, was fired from the quartet, and a young woman brought in to replace him. Uh, the young woman's name is Grace. She's referred to in this scene. The high stakes of the play is that the string quartet, with their brand new member, who's 15 to 20 years younger than the men in the group, have been asked to play at the White House. They're playing a televised engagement at the White House. Big audience, big high stakes for this event. Um... What else do you need to know about this? There's a character named Carl, uh, who's the cellist of the quartet and who has had uh, cancer several years ago and recently gone in for his medical exams and the outcome of that is not known as this scene begins. And I think that's all we really need to know at the moment. And the character of Alan is a little bit of a philanderer. He's separated from his wife now because of his dalliances and you'll figure out which character in the scene is a little anal uh, when the scene begins. So I'd like to welcome up three actors here. Uh, this is Will Irwin, who's playing Elliot, Ben Smallin playing Carl, and Tim Reinhardt, who is playing Alan. And I will read stage directions. Could you come up here, guys? We are backstage at the White House. Elliot and Alan, oh no, we're not reading that one. We're reading the second. <laughs> We are still backstage at the White House. Which page is it? Seven, seven, seven. Thank you. Carl is not on stage at the moment. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> Elliot soaks his left hand in a mug of water with the presidential seal. They're too bright. I told her. Told who? Marsha. Who the hell is Marsha? The girl, the assistant to the... Oh, the one you've been flirting with all night. I wasn't flirting. So what is Marsha going to do about it? Nothing. Why not? They set them this afternoon. They're too bright. I know. So they should change them. They can't. Of course they can. If they can set them, they can... They're for the TV cameras. God's sake. You want to be seen by 15 million people? Yes, but if I can't read the notes on the page... You know the notes. That's beside the point. Carl... Look, Carl we spent... is actually on the stage. Sorry, that was my error. In this draft, <clears throat> Carl is on stage. Come back on stage, Carl. Listening to this whole, this whole thing while doing the crossword puzzle. My error... Gentlemen, continue. Yes, but if I can't read the notes on the page... You know the notes. That's beside the point. 
Carl, look, I... we spent an hour and a half checking the levels this afternoon. They were fine then. They're fine now. They haven't changed. Did you even ask her whether they could be lowered? No, L, I didn't. Why not? Because they're fine. They're blinding. They're the levels we agreed to, Carl. Leave me out of it. <laughs> if I can't play my best... You do if... this every time. The lights are too bright. The lights are too dim. The stage is too hot. The, the chairs are too low. If I'm not comfortable... Well, you're never comfortable. Never. But it has nothing to do with the lights or the chairs or the pollen count. It's just you, L. You didn't think the lights were too bright? They never gave us dessert. <laughs> I think they're serving it now. Carl tosses down the crossword puzzle. Anybody want some? We go in ten minutes. But I've got ten minutes. Where's Grace? Down the hall. Not throwing up in the china room? Huh? She's warming up. Carl exits. Elliot sets down his mug, dries his hand on a cloth. Alan looks after Carl. When he's sure Carl is out of earshot... Elle. Elliot. What? Janice called me last night. Janice? While Carl was out of the house. She was sobbing. As soon as I picked up, she just lost it. It's back? In his brain and his liver. Oh, Christ. She was afraid he might not tell us... You know, Carl, keep it together. God damn. But she said he took it pretty hard. Have you said anything? Not to him. I knew this was going to happen. Something had to happen to intrude. Now, just when we're finding our balance, starting to think about the... He stops short. Alan turns to see why. Carl has just entered with a plate of cheesecake. Five minutes. Thank you. Thanks. What's that? Cheesecake? More or less. He sits and eats. I ought to find Grace. She's in the ladies. Ironic how, even in the White House, they still relegate the artists to the room beside the kitchen. Especially in the White House. That any good? She called you, didn't she? Yeah. Woman never could keep a secret. She needed to talk to somebody. Figured you did too. I'm sorry, Carl. It's shitty luck. Yeah. Anything you need, you know? Absolutely. Just ask. Explain it to my kids? Explain it? Because I'm, I don't see how I'm going to do it. And Janice, well, you know, she'll just, last time Kara was too young to know what was going on. Tim wasn't even born. Now they're both going to wonder why daddy's losing his hair and his lunch and his sense of humor. What am I supposed to tell them? Tell them the truth. Not a chance. He holds out his plate. Want some cheesecake? Elliot passes. Yeah, sure. He takes it. How is it? Not in New York. But what are you going to do? <laughs> okay, great. So that was... Stay there, gentlemen. Yes, we'll give them... You guys applaud everything, you know. We theater people, we wait till the end. But, you know, they're going to do more. So that was the scene as it exists now. Uh, now they're going to do the scene as it was originally drafted in the very first draft of the play. You should know in this version, Carl is actually the uncle of Grace the violist who has joined this quartet. He's her uncle. She's not nobody there. Um, Carl is not in the room in this one. He's outside the room entirely. And I think that's all we need to know in this version. I'm looking to you guys like, you know, for your permission. All right, so we start backstage at the White House. Um, Elliot and Alan are elegantly dressed in formal wear. So nice and loud. No. I know it's not ideal. Not but ideal? But I said I would bring it up anyway. It's a travesty. Carl said the same thing. Then why are we talking about it? Maybe not the whole movement. Maybe... Alan... Maybe just a single variation. No. Cut the repeat. They agreed to Opus 131. Yes, but... You told them it was 40 minutes long. Not in so many words. You didn't tell them it was 40 minutes long? She said we could play half an hour. I told well, who her... Who said? Marcia. Who the hell is Marcia? The girl, the assistant to the... And now she has a name? She's always had a name, you just never knew it. So what did you tell her? I said it would be fine, give or take. Give or take. Meaning... Meaning you didn't have the balls to tell her it's 40 minutes long. They never would have agreed to it. So now Marcia looks at the back of our CD and sees that it's 40 minutes long and wants to start lopping off movements. In a nutshell. Look, I'm sorry, I should have been clearer, but we have to make some kind of concession. Why? Because it's the White House, because they need time to serve dessert. <laughs> You're going to ask for her phone number, aren't you? No! <laughs> Not that it hasn't crossed my mind. <laughs> Fine. Tell her we'll cut the Allegro Molto Vivace. Really? Sure. 
Wait, we can't cut the- We're not going to cut it, we're just going to say we're cutting it. Elliot. What's she going to do? Interrupt the finale so they can serve the cheesecake? Carl enters eating cheesecake. <laughs> Five minutes. If timing was everything, they should have hired a DJ. Did you find Grace? She's down the hall. Not throwing up in the china room? Huh? Oh, great. <sighs> Never mind. Is that cheesecake? Yeah. Great. Just great. Well, if they're serving dessert now, we won't have to cut. Do you want to compete with forks on plates in the middle of the fugue? They're not serving yet. I swiped this from the cart. Tell Marsha... <laughs> tell Marsha we're going to, to make even the president forget about dessert. Elliot tunes his violin. Alan checks his watch. I ought to get Grace. Wait a second. I wanted to say something, just the three of us. Yeah? I had my thing yesterday. You know, the cat scan. Pet scan. Right. And? Not so good. Ah, oh, shit. Doctor didn't like the look of my spleen. Why not? Cut out a lymph node to make sure, but... God, I'm sorry. Janice was pretty upset. She was... And I don't blame her. It was scary for her last time, and that was, well, compared to this. I don't want my kids to see me sick. Kara was too young to know what was going on last time. Tim wasn't even born. Now they're both going to notice if Daddy's losing his hair and his lunch and his sense of humor. I don't want it. Not now. Carl, anything you need, you know. Absolutely. Just ask. Don't tell Grace. I'll tell her later. He said they might try bone marrow, so you never know. Right. Want some cheesecake? He holds up his plate. Sure. How is it? Not New York, but what are you going to do? There we are. These guys. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, the scene continues on from there, by the way, in the play. Um, so what was the differences? We heard first the way the scene is now. Then we heard the original draft. How did it change? There's a bit more, uh, Just be real loud so was, everybody can hear you. There was a bit more, um, I guess, character development between the three guys in the first one you did, I guess the, the later version. Uh -huh. But I, I guess I was a little surprised because you often talk about how um, things are simpler, shorter, and more, you know, more to the point, and it seemed like the earlier version was much more to the point and direct. Mm. Yeah, it, yes, the earlier version, in terms of the cancer stuff, in you're terms saying? Of or the, the cancer just, and kind uh -huh. of, um, yeah, you know, yes. Yes, I think that's probably right. Um, Somebody talk, well, somebody talk about the cancer stuff that doesn't have to be right now. Oh, well, that's what I was going to say, actually. Okay. Um, whereas, and I agree with you, but the first, well, the first draft you wrote was more direct, I felt that um, I, as an audience member, kept wondering and guessing at the second draft. Like, I, it wasn't, it, because it wasn't immediate and it wasn't direct, uh -huh. I kept asking what's going on, how next, what exactly is going on, how sick is he, yeah. all these things. Right, so that was a major, a major reason. It's one thing to have a character come in and say, by the way, I have cancer, and here's what it is, and I feel badly about it, and it's not going well. It's another thing for people to wait till he's left the room and say, oh, did you hear about this thing? It's bad, it's really bad. Goes, oh, he's back. Oh, cheesecake, right? Huh, isn't it good? Here we are in the backstage of the White House, and then have Carl say, she told you. Now what? So that, that basic theatrical notion of who knows what what is secret, what is withheld, what if it's discovered, is basically just interesting and dramatic and theatrical when people hide stuff and other people find out about it. Yeah, I don't um, know. In the second draft, you had the character complaining about the lighting and, and being unable to manage with the lighting, whereas in the first draft, the... Uh, well, the second, in other words, yes. I'm sorry, sorry, the, right. final draft, the final draft, he was complaining yeah, the about the lighting, whereas in the first draft, he was complaining about having to alter the music, which, as a choice, I think is much more valid because the discovery of the poor lighting is something that they would discover that evening at the zero hour, where the discovery of having to cut the music, I'm thinking that doesn't seem like that would they, they would have arrived at that problem at that critical moment when they did. And there's another factor, I think that's a good point, there's another factor related. Kaz, are you addressing that about lighting versus cutting? <laughs> Yes. Yes, exactly. So the question of who's unprofessional in this scene is utterly different. In one, Alan is unprofessional, and maybe he's trying to get in good with Marsha, so he hasn't told the truth, but he's not been doing his job. In the other one, Elliot we interpret as being temperamental, as being kind of a diva. 
and, and that that's been disruptive. And since by the end of the play, the quartet decides to vote Eliot out of the quartet, it's very important that we see the disruptive influence that he has at times based on his own predilections. Anything else? Yeah, that way. Can I ask yeah. the question? Sure. Um, what made you decide to take the element out of Grace being Carl's okay. niece? Yeah, so Grace in the first draft was Carl's niece. Why did I make her Carl's niece? The idea is that, you know, if the quartet is about a tight group of people, trying to find ways that characters are more intimately connected in more ways is often good, which is why we have so many family plays. And particularly when family crosses over with business, it creates more and more tensions, as anybody who's ever run a family business knows. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting, let me throw this question out. What's better, or what is helped by Grace being Carl's niece? Is there anything that's better? Yeah. Any tension involving Grace would then reflect on Carl? Yeah, she... exactly. Carl might have a protectiveness of her, or she might embarrass him about things. Uh, in this case of the play, Alan, who at times has somewhat of a predatory quality to him, if he's hitting on Grace, Carl's niece, that's a big deal. And in fact, he does hit on Grace in the newer version of the play. Um, what's better about having Grace not be his niece, Jessica? Her individual stakes or risks are higher because she doesn't have a safety net within the group. Right, yeah, she's on her own and she lives and dies by her own standing there. Adam? Also, I feel that the other group members understand her uh, complete unbiased opinion as being kind of fresh meat, and they may lunge <laughs> at her to try to lobby their point of view more fiercely to her. Right. And, you know, right. and, and as a consequence, uh, generate even more dramatic conflict than they had intended. Yes, that's a very good point. Yeah. And they also, there's one other thing that really has to do with her qualities. She's portrayed in the play as extraordinary. I mean, they're 20 years older than she is, and they've had lots of people audition for this empty slot, and she's the one they hire, even though she's 25. If she's a niece, we might suspect that that was, you know, a good in with the place. If they don't know her from Adam or Eve, and she still gets the job, we are led to believe as an audience that she is hot stuff. She is something extraordinary. And extraordinariness is very important to the play. How can we be extraordinary? What's falling short of that? How can we be more extraordinary? It's important. Great, Tom. Why change the cancers? Why change the cancers? I did more research after the first draft to the next draft. Um, I wanted it to be clear. It's hard to go past brain. I wanted to be clear that this was exceptionally dire and that the first uh, cancer was a lymphoma of some sort and, you know, great, we can cut it out. We can get rid of it and we'll check in and that his appointments have been good, his checkups have been good and that this one has been worse. So that was really, and it's a very good question because it connects with research. This play is the only one I've, of my full lengths that I've written out of six or seven plays that takes place here and now. All the others take place in different historical periods, different geographies, different countries. Um, that's because I love diving into other worlds to write plays. And so uh, I'm always doing research, particularly about period and profession and geography. Um, with this one, that wasn't the case. I could write people the way people talk now. These guys live in New York. I've been to New York. I live in a city. Um, there's a character, you know, these guys are in their 40s. I'm in my 40s. There's a dad with two kids. So there are a lot of things that were very close to my life demographically that were not true of the other plays. But still, lots of research. I need to know about cancer, so I need to talk with people with cancer, cancer survivors. I need to talk to an oncologist. I need to talk to orchestra players and string quartet players. I need to do research about music. I'm um, trying to think if there are any unusual things here. Audition procedures for um, world-class world orchestras and that sort of thing. Every play involves them. Any other observations on these differences between these two, two scenes? You may have noticed that the openings of the scenes sound the same. Elliot and Alan are arguing. It's a rapid fire dispute. The heat is building. It builds to blow up. The rhythms of those scenes are almost identical, even though the content is utterly different. I wanted to end the previous scene in a kind of still way, so that when we arrive backstage at the White House, boom, these guys are at it. And I liked that rhythm very much, but I realized I didn't like the content of the scene because it made Alan look unprofessional. And so I hewed very closely to the rhythms of the first draft, even though the content is different. So it was very much of a technical maneuver at that point. 
Great. Um, I'm currently working on a play um, called Ghostwriter, very different kind of play, and I wanted you to hear a scene from that, two different versions. And this will actually read in order. We'll hear the first draft of the play, and then the most recent draft of the play. And it's, it's due to be produced next season in Philadelphia, happily. So it will go through a lot more messy, I think, before it ultimately gets tidy. Um, what you need to know about this play, it takes place in 1919. A famous novelist named Franklin Woolsey has died about six months earlier. Um, nevertheless, his secretary, who takes his dictation by typing, has continued to deliver chapters of his novel to the publisher, even though he's died. And the publisher at first thinks that maybe this is just, you know, the stuff that he hadn't turned in yet, but he comes to realize that something unusual is taking place. And so the press gets wind of it. People start doing stories on this eccentric secretary who is channeling or something, or is she a fraud or is she delusional? Um, <coughs> Woolsey has a widow, Mrs. Woolsey, who's not at all pleased about this. Um, it was bad enough that her husband shared a room with another woman for a decade or so, um, day to day, and even though that, there's no reason to believe that that relationship was not anything but platonic, still it had an intimacy to it that she is envious of, and perhaps re resentful of. And it, you learn in the play, at least in the most recent draft, that uh, Mrs. Woolsey herself used to copy her husband's manuscripts out by hand, so the fact that he now dictates to a typist or has for some time rankled, and not at home. Um, where we are in the play is very late in the play again. Um, Myra, the secretary, uh, has a visitor, and that visitor <coughs> is the audience. And we learn over the course of the play that the visitor has been hired by Mrs. Woolsey as a debunker to basically sit with Myra, watch her work, and to find the hole, to find out that she's faking it, uh, that, she's, that she's a fraud. I don't think there's anything else that we need to know. Uh, Woolsey's publisher was Scribner's, which is an actual very esteemed publishing house who went on to publish Hemingway and Fitzgerald and many others. Uh, and Mr. Brownell is the, the editor at Scribner's, joined by Jessica Bedford, who's reading the role of Myra, and Kim Fairbanks, who's reading Mrs. Woolsey. Uh, Myra talks to this unseen visitor throughout the play, so when she begins speaking in both versions of this scene, that's who she's talking to. Naturally, I could not abandon the book, despite Mrs. Woolsey's protestations. She came to see me three nights ago, here, unlocked the door with her husband's key. The door opens. Then saw me sitting, waiting for the words. Mrs. Woolsey enters. Hello, Mary. Mrs. Woolsey? I didn't expect to find you here. Where did you expect to find me? Yeah. I didn't expect to find you at all. Well, here I am. What are you doing? Working. It's after 10 o'clock. Sometimes <coughs> we work late. Is that the manuscript? Some of it. Mrs. Woolsey lifts an inch or two of the pages with her thumb and lets the pages ripple past. Mr. Brownell tells me you delivered six more chapters just last week. What did he think of them? He hasn't read them. I don't believe you. He hasn't read them because I've asked him not to read them. As far as I'm concerned, what Mr. Brownell thinks at this point is irrelevant. We're very near the end. Really? Very near. I'm told you said that 400 pages ago. I was mistaken. Then what makes you think that you are not mistaken now? That this book will not stretch on and on over months and years and decades even? I couldn't bear it. You have no right, you know. No right? To perpetuate this fraud. What fraud? My husband is dead. I know. He died on July 13th. I was there. Being dead, he no longer speaks. Not to you, perhaps. To no one. I realize you may find this hard to accept. With all due respect, I believe you're the one who's had trouble accepting. Accepting what? That he would continue to speak to me, through me, and not to you. Mary. Myra. My name is Myra, or Miss Babbage, not Mary, never Mary. I thought... No, but... Never. Myra, then. The typing machine is yours. My husband saw to that. 
but you need to know that today I wrote to Mrs. Driver and stopped the rent on this room. That was unnecessary. On the contrary. I cannot have you here at all hours of the night indulging in this twisted fantasy at my expense. You misunderstand me. I don't think so. I already stopped the rent two weeks ago. You should receive a check for the balance from Mrs. Driver any day. You've rented the room yourself. This is where we work. In light of the new arrangement, I feel I must ask you to hand over Mr. Woolsey's key. I will not. I can have Mrs. Driver change the lock. Miss Babbage, if I prove, when I prove, that you have deliberately sought to deceive the public with this shameful scheme, I shall go to Scribner's and demand that Mr. Brownell relinquish the entire manuscript. As Mr. Woolsey's widow, that would be your right. And then I shall burn it. I shall burn it, page by page, until it is all gone. Mrs. Woolsey. Do you understand? You can't. I will not have this bastard novel in my home, much less mocking me from the bookstalls. It isn't right. And she exits. draft one. And this is the draft that is the, it's where it currently is. <laughs> I think I need to say much more about it than now. Go ahead. You can see now why I could never abandon the book. Why it must be seen to the finals full stop, despite her threat and She came to see me three nights ago, well after midnight. Lights shift as Mrs. Woolsey enters from the hallway. Hello, Myra. Mrs. Woolsey. Am I interrupting something? Not at the moment. Well, that must be a first. She wanders in, looks around. <coughs> it's late to be out. Yes, it is. Very late. But one must fill the night somehow, if not with sleep. She looks out the window. The days are simpler. Papers to sign, a literary luncheon, visits to the bank or the milliner, <clears throat> more dinner invitations than I can accept. But always I return home at night to find my husband absent from every room. Why have you come here? Well, the letter I sent you remains unanswered. My calls on your residence have been for naught. I'm rarely there. And you will not answer the telephone here, though I know you are here, as I knew tonight, by the light in the window. There was work to be done. Is that what you call it? That's what we call it. The newspaper articles and magazine stories have become quite a nuisance. I agree. An embarrassment, to be perfectly frank. The very idea of a ghost. The word is not my own. Your word or theirs. The premise is the same. And it is ludicrous. I do not claim to understand the intricacies of the next life. The intricacies of this one are perplexing enough. But I am quite confident that my husband is not dictating from beyond the grave. I know what I know. And what is that? What do you know? The words keep coming. Yes, but whose? His. They cannot be. Yet they are. Mr. Brownell showed me the chapters you delivered last week. What does he think of them? His opinion should not concern you. Mine, however, should. Very well. What do you think of them? I want to know how you do it. I don't know what you... Mimic his style so well. I am not a mimic. Do you work from his notes? No. Outlines? Neither. Or are you simply a clever forger? I do not write at all. I type. Yes, so you've always said, and yet. His words passed through my hand for years. Short stories, novels, so I was able to compose a rather respectable parody once for a party. It was quite amusing, I assure you, down to the tiniest detail they all said. But it was not him nor did it pretend to be. There is no pretense here. When I read those chapters at Scribner's, I thought my heart would stop. They are at once very like him, quite uncannily so, yet also utterly unfamiliar. Mr. Brownell said as much. So I want to know how you do it. I don't know. Does he appear to you? No. Does he speak? Not as such. Then does the machine itself do the typing? Mrs. Wolsey. Has he mentioned me? I do nothing out of the ordinary. I come, I sit, I wait. 
as I always have. Is that the manuscript? Some of it. Mrs. Woolsey reaches toward the pile to take up the last page, but Myra places her hand upon it. I will deliver it to Scribner soon enough. You realize this novel can never be published without my consent. Mr. Brownell said as much. Can you tell me then why I should give it? It is his greatest work. I hesitate to say his masterpiece as the term would surely embarrass him. Miss Babbage. Mrs. Woolsey. My husband is dead. I know. He died July 13th. I was with him. Being dead, he no longer speaks. Not through you, perhaps. Through no one. To no one. They are his words, not mine. How do you know? I don't know. I How? Because if they were not... Yes? <coughs> if they were not his... It would be just you, alone in a room. Yes. That's called being a writer. If I prove, when I prove, that you have deliberately sought to deceive the public with a shameful scheme, I shall go to Scribner's and demand the entire manuscript. That would be your right. And then I shall burn it. Page by page, chapter by chapter, until it is all gone. Mrs. Woolsey. Do you understand? I will not have this bastard novel in my home, much less mocking me from the bookstalls. It isn't right. And she exits again. What was different? First draft, latest draft, Adam, loudly. Uh, the, um, the later drafts put a lot more emphasis on the premise that this uh, manuscript is a masterpiece. Uh, and so when uh, the other woman, the one that Kim played, uh, threatens to destroy it uh, if she's given the legal right mm. would be whether, no matter what the circumstances are uh, regarding the authorship and the ghost mm -hmm. authorship, her destroying that becomes a dire consequence, mm -hmm. uh, much more so in the uh, later, your later draft than in your, earl your er earlier draft. Great, great, great observation. What else? Megan. Um, and then in the later version, Mrs. Woolsey is... A little louder. Um, in, in the later version, or the newest version, uh, Mrs. Woolsey has more uh, humanity. She has insight inside um, what um, the secretary is going through. I mean, like maybe, possibly, is ta has a talent, has writing, and she's interested in if, whether or not her husband's speaking to her. So it, it gives her so much more, a little more humanity, a little more depth. She's not just this evil person coming in and killing this off. Right. And well, no, so much right. as you know, uh, she's not, that her anger isn't just her driving force. It kind of comes out of nowhere. We almost expect her to kind of you know, maybe even understand this process a little bit before she kind of throws in the gauntlet and says, look, you know, so it kind of takes us with her and kind of lets us allow, allows us to like her a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a great observation. In the, in the very first draft, there's a kind of a Lady Bracknell quality to, <laughs> to conjure the character from Oscar Wilde's importance of being earnest. You know, she kind of barrels in and says, you must be this way. And, uh, and I discovered in the revisions that, that the character's gambits are, are rather broad. Well, I'm going to kick, stop the run on this room. You can't stop the run on this room because I already stopped the run on this room and I'm running it myself. Oh, yeah? And now I'm going to ask you for your key. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm going to burn the book. Um, and there was something a little <laughs> unsubtle about that. Um, <laughs> and it didn't do justice to Mrs. Woolsey in particular. Um, when I was doing the revision, I was working very painstakingly on it. I got to the scene and I thought, why doesn't she take the typewriter? Now, in the first draft, it says, well, Mrs. Mr. Driver, it's presumed, has willed you the typewriter. But I thought, would he really do that? It doesn't seem like he would take the time to will her the typewriter in advance of his sudden death. So I thought, all right, why can't she just take the typewriter? And then I realized that most of all the play is flashback, so Myra wouldn't be sitting with the typewriter in the play. So I thought, oh, she can't take the typewriter. And I thought, well, why wouldn't she take the typewriter? She wouldn't take it if she weren't sure. And in the first draft, she's sure. You're a fraud, and I want you to stop. And in the second draft, she's not sure. And if she's not sure, it's kind of like saying, 
if my husband really is trying to finish his novel, oh my God, even though I'm not happy about it coming through her instead of me, I couldn't possibly abort it. So she really needs to know and she really needs to find out. But she also wants to put the screws to Myra and say, you don't really know, like how do you know it's him? So that Myra now has to acknowledge to some degree doubt and doubt is much more interesting than certainty. And I think that's why that's the earlier version is much less interesting to me. Both characters are certain and they don't adopt each other's point of view at all. They just fight. In the second one, they're forced to actually negotiate each other and their vulnerability. There was Ben. Well, was, like you said, it's not aggressive. Um, and so you're not sure what her intention is. And that's where you get the, I mean, I, I still got the sense that she was, um, not necessarily sure, but wanted to believe that that Myra was a fraud, mm -hmm. uh, and that this was not her husband talking through this typist. But that that lack of certainty uh, um, at, caused her to act differently in yeah. the situation. Yeah, that's a good point. And in, in fact, in the first draft, she's never she's decided not to read the pages that Myra's been submitting. In the second one, she's read all of them, and so it gives a lot more credence to this. Look, and again, extraordinariness is exciting theatrically. It's why it's better if Grace is a better violist, because there's something amazing about it. John Paul. Uh, the, the first draft is about the conflict between the two women, and mm -hmm. the second draft is about the book. Hmm. You know, hmm. So I saw so much more of the, this, this. The first draft was just, you know, character A wants something, character B right. wants something else, watch them do that. Whereas in the second draft, it's, it really is much more about this process of discovery. Both of them are actually incredibly preoccupied with the book and with yeah. what it means. And I, I agree so much that there's so much more humanity in Mrs. Woolsey in the second draft, particularly because you start to you start to realize that uh, she cannot mourn her husband if he's still alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. she's not just being a kind of cruel, distant, uh, not in my house kind of person. She's right. saying, you are preventing me from, from my husband is dead. I know that, you need to know that. That needs yeah. to be true for me to go on with my life. And that's why I love the early dialogue, which is like, I have these invitations and I have stuff to do. I'm going on with my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and in order for me to do that, you need to as well. Or you, yeah. you have to come up to the present as well, the past as well. Yeah, that's a great observation. And you know, Myra uh, has made it a very big point. She's honored this notion of being the, the typist, the facilitator that allows his words to come out and flow through. She hasn't conceived of herself as a, as a writer in any way, and yet has she channeled these words so much that he, she understands what he would write, and the play suggests that that's the case. Um, there's one other thought. But the acknowledgement that she might, in fact, be alone all this time, and clinging to those words that come out as a way of clinging to him is, I'm, I'm thinking, sobering for her. Yeah. Adam, yeah. Uh, earlier, you said that in the first draft, she comes off ineffectively as being uh, Lady Bracknell, whereas in the second version, I felt that she came off effectively as Hedda Gabler, <laughs> <laughs> who, who is rather uh, uh, ired at the fact that someone other than her, she attempted mm -hmm. this parody that was pretty good but not great, and uh -huh. that maybe some other woman in his life mm -hmm. Uh, whether or not we're dealing with supernatural forces, but is able to appreciate him on a level, and mm -hmm. you know, like the head of Gabler burns the manuscript, yes, she intends right. on doing the exact same thing. Good. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. And in fact, in fact, there is in both of the both plays a sense of manuscript as baby. And in this case, if the baby is being, you know, if it's his baby with her, if it's you know, she uses the phrase, "I won't have this bastard novel in my house." If if it's in <laughs> fact only your book. I don't want it anywhere. If it's his book, how could it be his book? But if it were his book, I couldn't do it. So it becomes a little more complex. Are there any broad questions? I realize that we're just about out of time, but I wanted to um, take a question if there was a thought or interest in anything there. Oh, well, you've been talking a lot about your different drafts. I was wondering what it's like when you make the transition from you working to put together the play, and then when you go give it away, or you make that step to where you bring everybody else in, how, how is it for you? Does it change a lot? How, what did, you know, you, you, you held up your final published version. Is that the version that you put the last period on and then went, took it to, to a director, or is that something that continues to evolve after? It wasn't published until it had 
a dozen productions. Um, and it changed every single draft, every single production that the script changed because I would change probably forever. So for me, the published script is a way of saying, done enough. <laughs> this process could be kind of addictive and you could change for God. There's a wonderful quote by um, poet Paul Valéry who said that a poem is never finished, only abandoned. You're never really done, but at some point you say enough. And so that's that. Um, when it comes time to publish, I'm very, very painstaking about it because I know I'm going to have to live with that. And I still get questions every now and then. One question is that there's a reference to the president, and several references to the president in the play, and the play was written during the Bush administration, Bush II. Um, and so there's some president bashing going on, um, which is probably likely among this group of people, this, this quartet. And, and you know, at, at Bush's lowest ebb, um, would get cheers in the audience, which actually, you know, it was a little embarrassing because I didn't want it to feel like such a slam dunk. Um, but it's a different presidency now, and there's a lot of pre president bashing in the play. And so there's questions about, like, are they talking about this president? Are they talking about that president? Because it's a very different presidency. So a line changed in the play where they're asking Grace whether she's been to the White House and, and that they're going to play... The White House, and her line in the play had been, I didn't vote for him, is that okay? Kind of a laugh line there. And, and the new version is, I didn't vote for him either term, is that okay? So the audience at least knows that there was a two-term president that was being referred to. Now, should Barack Obama be elected for another term? Maybe that's an, a different question. But um, the changes are very, very small at this point. I haven't made any changes specifically for any any productions other than this, but over the years, every now and then people will ask about a line or I'll come up with something. But I, I often don't know now about productions until they happen, until I, you know, I don't necessarily speak to my collaborators anymore. They get, the, the play is the product that they rent, you know, and it gets done. And it's going, it's going on right now in uh, Texas, actually, in, in Fort Worth, so, and I won't see the production, so it does leave me. In the early stages, first production, second, third, fourth, I tend to be very closely involved because I'm still learning about the play and, um, and making changes more heavily. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Is there another? I thank you for your attention and your time.